Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. I am so excited that you are here listening this week. This is a place where I talk about wellness and nutrition and fitness and supplements and all sorts of things like that. If you are a longtime listener, good for you. That's really impressive. I've had this podcast actually since 2019. I took a hiatus for a while in 2020, maybe. I don't know. It was a while. And then I brought it back. And what is very exciting, I guess I can now talk about it, is that I'm actually moving to two episodes a week starting in April. I, yeah, I I don't think I've really talked about this much on here, but I've moved into my business full time and I was actually working at a different health and nutrition business for a long time, actually, as a technical program manager. So essentially just like running the online programs and courses and software and which is great. And I really enjoyed it, but now I'm moving, I'm in my business full time. And this was a decision that is very intentional and is something that I thought about for a very, 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 very long time. It was always the goal. It was always the intention behind starting my Instagram account is like kind of how it started even back then years ago when I did that, it was always the intention of like, this will be my full-time business. Regardless of different revenue streams, my business will be full-time. And so that's where I'm at now, which is very exciting. And it feels very, very good. It feels very in tune with my lifestyle and with me. And I feel very happy about it. So that's kind of the space that I'm in right now. I'll probably do a whole episode on like career and how it impacts you emotionally and mentally and running your own business and being a female entrepreneur, et cetera. But that's not for today. I am very, yeah, I'm just very excited to be in this place. And I definitely do want to share more about it when I have more to say about it, I guess. I do want to talk about briefly before we dive into this week's episode is my guide, my free guide on my website, my bio, biohack your cycle guide. It's a chart essentially. And I created this chart like a long time ago. Again, if you've been an OG listener, you've probably heard me talk about this years ago. I think I created it in 2019 and it, it's been updated. I actually do want to update it again, but essentially it's a chart that has all of the different things that you can do for the different phases of your menstrual cycle. So if you look at it, if you go lengthwise, like on the rows, it will have the phases. So like it goes menstrual, follicular, ovulatory, and luteal phase. And then the columns are how it feels, nutrition, supplements, movement, and lifestyle. So essentially it's the idea behind it is kind of in par with cycle syncing. And the idea is like different nutrition, supplements, movement, and lifestyle practices can really support you depending on the phase that you are in of your menstrual cycle. Now, cycle syncing is one of those things where it's very trendy. It's all over TikTok. You know, a lot of people are talking about it. This is kind of like that for sure. Like, you know, you are adjusting kind of what you're doing and what you're eating and your movements to different phases of your cycle, but it's more than that as well. Like it's more than just, nutrition and movement. It's lifestyle and it's how you feel as well. I do want to flush this out more though, now that I'm looking at it, because I actually want to add more biohacking to it in terms of like castor oil packs, red light therapy, acupuncture, different things like that. I'm going to flush it out more. But if you're interested in this chart, you can just download it on my website. It's free. And I've been using this for a long time. So just kind of learning. I think the biggest takeaway from it is like you feel different throughout different days and phases of your cycle. And so like, let's do things that support that. So, you know, during your menstrual cycle, like that's the most obvious one is like when you're on your period, you're really, really feeling like lower energy. There's a lot of self-reflection going on. You actually have a higher pain sensitivity. So just being aware of things like that. And it's all in one chart, super easy to read. So I encourage you, 
if you are interested in learning more about your menstrual cycle, your health, your hormones, and balancing everything, I suggest you download this and just have a read through of it. <laughs> I, uh, there's things coming up this year I want to talk about, but I can't talk about yet because legally I can't. But this is kind of just like a preview of other things to come. So if you're into this type of thing, I suggest you download it and just start incorporating it really and really see how it feels and see how it impacts your signs and symptoms that you deal with throughout your menstrual cycle. So a lot of people, a lot of women have pain or cramping or bloating or breast tenderness or irritability. And so when we can kind of live more in our cycles, we can we can understand ourselves better and we can reduce our signs and symptoms. So that's kind of the whole premise. So let me know what you think. A quick shout out this week to the sponsor and who's also on the podcast this week is Bioptimizers. So I am blessed to have Matt Galant who joined me on the podcast this week. We talked about a lot. He is one of the founders of Bioptimizers. And I listen, like there are certain companies that I love and there's certain companies that I could do without. Bioptimizers is one of the ones that I very much use in my day-to-day life. Even before I started working with them, this was the case. And that's because their products are actually the best on the market for what they do. So example, their magnesium, their magnesium has seven different types of magnesium in it, right? Like it's full spectrum magnesium. I don't see other companies doing that. I don't see other companies taking a holistic approach to their supplements like that. Their digestive enzymes, the same thing. There's so many different enzymes in there that really helps you digest your food regardless of the food that you're taking. So there's things for like the macronutrients, protein, carbs, fat. There's also enzymes for gluten and lactose. And so it's very, it's very thoughtful behind it. There's a lot of intention behind their products. And that's why I love them so much. So in this episode, we talk about that. We talk about sleep and how we can sleep better. And not just like the type of take a melatonin and call it a night. Let's talk about biohacking your sleep. Let's talk about your environment. And Bioptimizers came out with a sleep product, which is fantastic. And the idea is like, let's not take melatonin. Let's take the precursors to melatonin. And Matt explains why on this episode. So it's very interesting. We also talk about living in Panama. And if you have been listening, I don't know, for the last few months, you know that I am in Costa Rica. And more than that, I am like low-key assessing where I want to live long-term. And if that's Canada or if that's not Canada, and if Central America might be a better option. And so it was super interesting talking to someone like him because He used to live in Canada. He understands. He is an entrepreneur and he's very much into health. And like I've said before, I think it's so interesting that Central America specifically attracts so many people who are in the health world, the wellness world. And yeah, I just have to kind of think why, you know? So we talk about that. We talk about living in a different country like that and how that impacts impacts your sleep, right? And I think that's important to note always is the biohacks that work for me in Canada aren't necessarily going to work for someone in Panama City because it doesn't make sense. Like I open my window, I get cold air at night because it's winter and it's cold (laughs) and it's zero degrees in Vancouver. In Panama, it's 30 degrees and that doesn't make sense. So it was really nice talking about that and really acknowledging the difference in different countries and where you live and how that impacts the healthy decisions and choices that you make. And I think it's very easy for a lot of people in US and Canada, North America, to just kind of overlook that. But we always have to kind of take a step back and say, okay, first of all, accessibility is an issue for a lot of people and also affordability is a lot of, is an issue for a lot of people. So not everyone has access to the things that people in North America do in terms of biohacking and healthy habits and healthy choices and things like that. 
So we talk a lot about that type of stuff today. I hope you enjoy this episode. We, I love talking about sleep and I talk about my own journey with sleep on this episode as well. And stay tuned for another episode next week. If you want to follow my journey in Costa Rica right now, you can do so at Biohacking Brittany. That is basically the only place where I'm currently on live posting content. I'm taking a lot of time off because it's necessary and unplugging feels fantastic. So yeah, stay tuned for another podcast episode next week. And I hope you enjoy this one. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. I am joined by a friend of a friend today, which is really exciting and actually doesn't honestly happen that often. Matt Gallant is joining me. He is an author, a entrepreneur, a CEO of Bioptimizers and Newtopia. I talk about Bioptimizers a lot. I use multiple of their products and have, I think for multiple years now, actually, as well. So Matt, I'm so excited and honored that you're coming on the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I've been following you since our good friend Luke hooked us up and I've been watching your journey and your social media journey. And you know, it's been awesome to see you grow and build a great following. Thank you. Yeah, Luke is so funny. I think we became friends like years ago at this point. And it's been really cool to actually you know, see his career. And he's always like sending me entrepreneur advice. And he's talked to me multiple times about you and like your success. So it's awesome that it's all kind of, you know, the dots are being connected. So today we're talking about sleep. And I think sleep is so underrated. I spent basically all of 2019 optimizing my sleep, biohacking my sleep, because I really wasn't sleeping very well. So I would love to hear about your personal sleep journey and kind of maybe where you used to be and where you are now in terms of sleep quality and stuff like that. Yeah, I hit two different sleep crises in my life. The first one was in my 20s. I was obsessed with working. I was a workaholic. I was working about 80 hours a week in the gym. Plus, I was recording an album, studying marketing, training twice a day. I was married. Obviously, didn't have much of a social life. But Sleep was getting in the way of me being productive. So I decided, well, let me try to reduce my sleep. I started cutting my sleep by 15 minutes every few days and felt decent until I got to about the five hour range. And when I got down to four hours, I just crashed. It took me about two months to recover from that. Read a book called Power Sleep by James Moss and then realized I needed eight to nine hours to really maximize my productivity and my health. So I started doing that. Fast forward about a decade, I started tracking my sleep using the Zio and the Oura Ring, the V1. And to my surprise, I was only getting about zero to 15 minutes of deep sleep a night. And that correlated with the highest body fat score I ever got on a DEXA scan. My testosterone crashed to the low 200s. And I just felt horrible pretty much every day that I woke up and realized that the number one thing I could do was to invest in my sleep. So I've spent about 45 grand on optimizing my sleep ever since. And I'm excited to share kind of what worked and what didn't with you. Yeah, that's wild. 45 grand. I definitely, you know, spent a pretty penny as well, experimenting and trying different things. I don't think it was 45 grand, but I'm so curious, like, what were your key takeaways of things that really, really worked for you? First of all, I think people need to get the right matches for their body so that you know, I spent 10 grand on a custom made Essentia mattress. You don't need to spend 10 grand on a mattress. I think if you can find the right mattress for your sleep position and your body type, you can get really good sleep. So first, if you're a back sleeper, you have a massive advantage for a couple of reasons. One is you're spreading out the weight over a much larger surface area. And one of the main sleep disruptors is blood flow constriction. So when you're a size sleeper, for an example, obviously your shoulder or your hips, if you're a woman with wider hips or, or larger legs, is going to press into the mattress. And that can cause blood flow to be constricted in that area and cause you to toss and turn while you're sleeping, which is obviously going to disrupt the quality of your sleep. So back sleepers have less of a risk there. And the other reason that back sleeping is better is for your spine. If you ask any chiropractor, they'll tell you that's the best sleep position. 
But for some of us, myself included, I just can't sleep on my back. So I'm a side sleeper. And because I, I lift weights and I have relatively large shoulders, I need to, my shoulder to sink into the mattress. Like I've had shoulder injuries traveling and sleeping in, in poor mattresses. Basically, my shoulders compressed so much for six, seven, eight hours that I wake up and I have to do five, 10 minutes of stretching just to try to get my shoulder back uh, to normal. So, you know, size sleepers definitely need to sink in more and they need a memory foam mattress. And if you look at the research on off gassing and mattresses, there's a lot of off gassing that occurs with the majority of mattress brands. And that's why I settled with Essentia. Now let's talk about mattress density. The heavier you are, the shorter you are, and the wider you are, the more you need to sink in. You need a softer mattress. If you're lighter, taller, or narrower, then you need a denser mattress. So it's not just getting a memory foam. It's also picking the right one for your body type. And of course, there's a bunch of mattress brands I haven't tried, but I think that's really where great sleep starts. And I'll, I'll pause there before I move on to the next point. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I upgraded to a much better mattress this year. I also prioritized getting a larger one, like a king size one and just having more space. And I am naturally a side sleeper, but I've been training myself to become a back sleeper for multiple reasons. It's kind of rough, to be honest, to train yourself. Like it, it definitely does impact my sleep quality. It's better, but it's one of those things that I know it's going to take months in order for me to actually be able to sleep on my back throughout the whole night and not wake up. Have you tried switching to become a back sleeper at all? Or are you just okay with sleeping on your side? I'm okay with it. I've done a lot of neurofeedback about like eight weeks of my life. And when I'm on my back, my brain goes right into a, a theta brainwave state. And I've trained so much that I can just kind of hang out there. So when I go to bed, I'll actually get on my back and kind of meditate for five, 10 minutes. And then, okay, when I'm ready, I just flip over to my side and usually pass out very quickly. So if I just stay on my back, I'll just stay awake. I mean, I don't know if I could train myself, maybe, but I certainly admire you trying. Yes. Yeah. It's, I guess that makes sense. It feels better when I sleep on my back, very much for the reasons that you said, like the weight distribution. And also it doesn't impact my posture as much. I find now I'm kind of, my shoulders are almost rounding forward a bit, especially with working online at the computer as well. It's kind of just like, I'm kind of just, I don't have a round back, but like I can see how people get to that point after years and years. So I think sleep helps with that. And also it's just so much better for your skin on your face actually to sleep on your back compared to your side. Like I have a satin pillowcase, blah, 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 but like still you're pulling the skin. It's being smushed essentially. So from that standpoint, I'm trying to sleep on my back. We'll see how long it takes me to get to the point where I can do it successfully every single night. So aside from like sleeping positions and your mattress, what else have you found has really moved the needle for you? Yeah, let's start with some free things or inexpensive things. Light is one of the biggest ones. And back when I was getting eight, nine hours of sleep, but sleeping horribly, I didn't understand that your skin has photoreceptors. So I was wearing a sleep mask. And of course, I was wearing, I had curtains and blinds, but there was still some light coming in. And if you look at the literature, the research on skin and photoreceptors and melatonin production, you're going to destroy natural melatonin production if you have almost like any level of light hitting your skin. So I strongly recommend people get absolute blackout curtains. Like I have two levels, two layers of blackout curtains because I live in the city. If people live outside the city, then maybe not as much of an issue. But if you're in a city, you would definitely be well served to set up some hardcore blackout curtains in your bedrooms because I think that's one of the most impactful things. And then there's temperature. There's a note on temperature. I used to sleep in a 16 degree, 17 degree Celsius, 65 Fahrenheit bedroom, and I was still sweating and losing three to four pounds of water every night. 
And the reason was your body will trap heat between your skin and the mattress. And I, until the chili pad came out, I was losing three to four pounds of water, waking up feeling de dehydrated. And it was a big reason why my deep sleep was getting destroyed. I was overheating. So if you don't have a chili pad, or I think there's the sleep aid, which I've never used, but there's a few cooling technologies that allow you to control the temperature underneath the sheets, which for me, my wife, and so many people have been just an absolute lifesaver. So I don't know if you use any of those, but for anybody who has a hot metabolism, I think they're almost a necessity. Yeah, I haven't actually tried those. And honestly, it's one of the sleep biohacks I would say I haven't done yet, which is quite surprising. I have a couple of like, I don't know, I question like the EMF that kind of goes along with it of putting something underneath your mattress that you're sleeping on. I don't know if you know anything about that, but does is that a thing or is it like not as much of a concern? Yeah, it was a good segue into like stuff that did not work. But yeah, most of those go to Bluetooth mode or sorry, airplane mode when they're on. And so it's not a concern. But I I sleep in a Faraday cage. So for those for people that don't know what a Faraday cage is, it's a cage or netting that blocks EMF signals, EMFs is electromagnetic frequencies. And to be frank, it did not move the needle at all. Now on the flip side, what did not work and actually would say destroyed my sleep is PEMF devices. So there are a lot of technologies that use frequencies, whether it's magnetic or radio or other types of signals that can improve your health or improve different biological functions. And I'm a huge fan of PEMF devices, but about half a dozen different ones from the ERT pulse to the Beamer to a bunch of ones inspired by the DARPA Delta Wave enhancers, and none of them work consistently. They work like some of the time, and other times it just absolutely destroyed my sleep. So that's been my experience with EMF and PEMF devices. Yeah, that's really surprising. Again, like PEMF isn't something that I've actually tried, but it's very popular in the biohacking circles. And it's interesting that you did try it and it didn't work for you. I, I definitely am concerned about EMF in general, and it's good that the cooling pads go into airplane mode. I find in terms of, you know, just like circling back to temperature, what I've recently started doing is, like I'm in Canada and it's winter, so I can do this right now. I open the windows into my bedroom a few hours before we go to sleep. And I close the door. And so by the time that I go to bed, it's so cold in the bedroom that we, I like never, ever put the heater on in there. And it's so fresh because there's so much fresh air, even if it's like snowing outside, if it's raining, whatever. And it's made a significant difference in how I sleep and how good I feel in the morning versus just kind of keeping it room temperature, you know, it not being as fresh in there as well. And I understand like you're in Panama right now. So like you must really, really prioritize sleeping in the cold because obviously it's so hot all the time and that's so uncomfortable to try and fall asleep in. No, yeah, no, you definitely have a, an advantage there being in Canada and I am Canadian, but left a long time ago. Yeah, so for us here, it's it's a bigger concern and you got humidity to deal with as well, but the AC was not enough. And I would say again, if you're a man that lifts weights, that has a lot of muscle mass, or if you're a woman in menopause or premenopause, those are, are more cons important considerations. On the EMF, my current opinion is, I think it depends on the person. I think some people seem to be more sensitive to EMFs and, and probably get more disruption. The other element with EMF is that it's distant determined or distant dependent, meaning that if you're really close to a Wi-Fi unit or a Bluetooth unit, you're going to get a much stronger signal. So obviously I don't have any Wi-Fi in my bedroom and any Wi-Fi signals that I am getting are passing through cement. So I think that I'm not saying EMFs are not an issue, but unless you have them next to you, I think they have a minimal level of disruption. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think yeah, you can definitely turn off the Wi-Fi, turn off your phone, that type of thing. But I don't think it's going to move the needle enough compared to 
sleeping in the right temperature or getting rid of blue light, which has like really profound effects on your sleep. I'm curious, and I don't know if you have an answer for this, but since you've lived in Canada and now you live in Panama, is there like, I know, and I know you've had this like sleep journey, but what, is there a difference that you see on your sleep quality, like solely based on your location? Meaning like, I'm sure you probably see the sunset more and you have more natural light compared to living in Vancouver, where it's like dark by 4.30 and it rains all day. Like how has that maybe impacted your circadian rhythm and your sleep at night? It's a great question. So my parents live in New Brunswick and they live in a village and they live in a dead end street. And I usually go visit them twice a year. And when I go there, there's a level of quietness that is almost surreal. I mean, there's maybe like five, six cars a day that drive in front of their home. Like it's that level of quiet. And when I go there in the summer, for an example, and you open up the windows to get in fresh air and you just don't hear anything except bugs, there's a level of just relaxation I feel I can hit that you you don't realize you you don't hit in the city, right? I live in Panama City. There's obviously constant background noise, even though I don't hear it consciously. I think subconsciously, it, it, there's some level of low-grade stress. So I think it's more of a city versus country thing. When I would say countryside versus Panama versus Canada. Because yeah, when I travel, if I go to a, a resort where it's equally as quiet, I tend to get that same kind of relaxation response. Yeah, that makes sense. I think like the noise pollution is a serious thing. I live on an intersection. It's not that big, but you know, it's definitely something. And I would love to live in more of a quiet place. You know, this is a conversation that's much bigger than this, but when we yeah, when we were buying our place a couple of years ago, it was kind of this idea of solitude versus isolation and how do you kind of find the perfect spot for you. But now that I've been in this spot for a couple of years, I'm definitely looking for a bit more isolation at this point health-wise. But yeah, I think that's really important. And I personally have a fan, a Dyson air filter fan in my room. And that really helps because it's kind of like white noise. And it really, really helps put me to sleep, actually, and just like drowns out anything that I might hear from the street. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. So I'm running, again, the chili pad. I've got AC so and an air filter. And those three combined, just I don't hear traffic. I mean, I never hear it because of all the white noise. And for anybody that's in a city, and there's even like pink noise machines and white noise machines. Those are really good options. And I really, for people that's in a really noisy environment, I really like the Mac earplugs. I first heard Tim Ferriss talk about it. And they're basically an over-the-ear canal type of earplug versus an in-the-ear canal. And those help a lot too because you hear yourself breathing and your breath becomes hypnotic. So it's a really good tool as well, I think, from a, a sleep quality perspective. Like when you do wear earplugs, you become hyper aware of your breath. And that alone, I think, enhances sleep significantly. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I have an app on my phone, actually. I think it's called like Sound Sleeper or something like that. It's actually designed for like kids and babies. But whenever I travel and like say I'm on an airplane or airplanes can be okay because it's actually a bit of white noise, but I will actually put it on and kind of drown out what's around me. And it really, really does help put me to sleep. But I'm curious if you have any, uh, you know, opinions on this and like, you might not, but I think about, I mean, I don't have kids, but I do want to have kids at one point. And I think about the stance that I'm going to have on their sleep. And because there's some people who are like, you know, you should be loud and not turn down the TV or whatever. And like, let noise continue in the home as it would so that they can sleep and get used to it. And then there's some people who like, have a white noise machine for their babies and are so particular about the creating like almost like a cave environment for their baby to sleep in. Do you know anything on that? I've, I haven't researched this at all, but I'm curious where I'm going to land on this in the future. So I'm just curious what you think. 
I don't have research, but I can tell you my end of one story, which is, you know, we have a baby girl. She's almost 11 months old and like 90, 95% of evenings, she's sleeping like 10 hours straight, maybe one every 10, 20 nights. She'll wake up a bit earlier. So yeah, she's been sleeping really well. And you know, we have a, a four floor penthouse and she's below kind of where we have the TV. So there is some background noise and we don't try to be like hyper quiet. And obviously again, we're in the city. So there is some noise pollution in the background and she just seems to have adapted to that and sleeping really well. I have been feeding her a P3OM, which is one of our probiotic products. And as a side note, like we have a half million dollar machine called an HPLC machine, which we allows us to test all of the neurotransmitters that the probiotics produce. And P3OM is one of the most powerful GABA producing probiotics we've ever tested. So it makes sense that P3OM helps with sleep. And I've also been feeding her Biome Breakthrough, which is another one of our probiotic blends since she's just a few weeks old. And you know, when she's 18 months old-ish, I will probably be start feeding her a little bit of Magnesium Breakthrough as well, probably before sleep to help her sleep better. Because again, she's she needs minerals and I'm not confident there's enough minerals and food content, unfortunately. Yeah, that's interesting. I take all of those products that you mentioned. I wouldn't, again, like this is something, it's kind of just ahead of where I am in life right now. But yeah, that obviously makes a lot of sense that it's important to get her to have and really support her in her sleep. And that's so nice that she's sleeping throughout the night. Like that must be so easy on you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's critical. And of course we have we have help here. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's great. So actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, what do you recommend for people who maybe have a newborn or have a new kid and, or maybe some other disruptor, but they're being woken up multiple times through throughout the night and there's not really much that they can do about it because say it's like a child and it's responsibility. Like how do you recommend people optimize their sleep when that's their reality? Yeah, so your body and back to when I was on a crazy lifestyle and trying to sleep four hours. I mean, obviously polyphasic sleep is something that some people try to do. And usually it's a short lived experiment. (laughs) I've never met anybody that's in polyphasic sleep for years and years, but your body can adapt. Typically you need about like 90 minute sleep cycles. So if you're just constantly being disrupted and if you can get some sleep throughout the day, you could potentially catch up. Now on the molecule side, glycine is potentially a game changer. First of all, glycine is just an amazing amino acid for health in general. But for sleep, when you look at the literature, it's one of the few molecules that showed that if people did not get enough sleep, they actually it actually reduces sleepiness and fatigue during the next day. So it's a really powerful way that's why we included it in sleep breakthrough and i think glycine in general for collagen production and all kinds of other health functions is just incredible so yeah glycine is definitely a good option napping i'm a personally a big fan of non-sleep deep rest i'm not a napper but if i do find myself tired i'll just close my eyes i don't try to nap i'm not trying to meditate i'm essentially trying to do nothing. And if my brain wants to think about things, I just let it. And I'm typically rebooted within five to 10 minutes when I do that. So, you know, I think people need to find what works for them, whether it's napping, meditation, non-sleep, deep rest, and make sure that they're trying to get more micro burst of recovery throughout the day because they're going to need it. Stress is a common factor that affects everyone in today's fast-paced world, leading to various health issues, including heart problems, inflammation, obesity, and mental illness. While most people focus on finding relief through meditation or trips to the spa, what if the root cause of stress is actually a deficiency in a key nutrient? Introducing Magnesium Breakthrough, the ultimate magnesium supplement that offers the full spectrum of all seven types of magnesium specifically formulated to reach every tissue in your body for maximum health benefits. 
This one-of-a-kind product is designed to reverse low levels of magnesium, which could be causing a multitude of health problems. But what sets magnesium breakthrough apart is its ability to impact the release of stress hormones like cortisol and block the activity of more stimulating neurotransmitters, leading to a more peaceful and resting state. This means that this supplement acts like a break on your body's nervous system, helping to calm and soothe, promoting a better quality of life. Simply go to magbreakthrough.com slash biohackingbrittany to get 10% off magnesium breakthrough with the discount code biohackingbrittany. And for a limited time only, if you buy three bottles, you get an exciting gift with your purchase, which is blue light blocking glasses. This is a limited time offer for select orders, so don't wait. Go right now to magbreakthrough.com slash biohackingbrittany and use my discount code biohackingbrittany at checkout. This will be linked in the show notes and on my website as well. Yeah, I think that's fair. I like the idea of trying to cycle 90 minutes. I think that's I think that's really smart. Obviously, you can't always do that, but I, I do think that's a good idea. And napping as well. And I'm not a napper, like... But I do think that that's something that I would bring in. And I remember, you know, when I was a kid, my dad would nap often. And I remember like making fun of him for it. But now that I understand it, I'm like, I get it. You had three children and you wanted to nap. And like, I, I'm not judging you anymore. But you know, as a child, it's just, you just don't get it. You're like, why do you need to rest during the day? Like that's what nighttime is for. But yeah, I definitely understand it now. It's interesting with your new supplement that you came out with, your sleep supplement. So I've been taking it and kind of experimenting with it. And one of the things that you talk about in it or like the ingredients is that it's precursors to melatonin, precursors to help you sleep better rather than, hey, here's five milligrams or whatever it is of melatonin itself. So what was the thinking behind that? And like, what's your stance on melatonin in general? I think it's always a better strategy to try to give the body the building blocks it needs, including the cofactors, so that it naturally produces the target molecule, which in this case is melatonin. Sometimes that doesn't work and you need to go to exogenous forms. And I'm not against that, but I think that should be the last resort. So I think the biggest mistake people are taking or making with melatonin is they're taking too much. If you look at the literature, and a few years ago, people started the narrative of 350 micrograms. But I looked at the literature, and the brain naturally produces 10 to 80 micrograms. And there's some people, myself included, and I heard Tim Ferriss talk about this, and Dr. Andrew Huberman talk about this, that if they take too much melatonin, they'll wake up earlier, and their sleep's disrupted. So melatonin never really worked for me, except when I realized that I was basically overdosing. When I started to reduce my melatonin dosage from half a milligram, which most people would say is a small dose, down to 40 to 80 micrograms, which is like a tenth of that, I started sleeping better and not getting an issue. But yeah, my strategy for years has been, let's give the body what it needs And magnesium, of course, is an incredible precursor to serotonin. And then when you add P5P, it helps convert more of that magnesium. And in the lab, we've just proven in the last few weeks that the P5P helps shuttle the magnesium, more magnesium into your red blood cells. So we always knew that magnesium breakthrough was just superior for absorption and it just hits different, it hits harder, and it just works better. And we're working on all this research to prove that it is increasing uptake. And we're seeing that, yes, when you're combining magnesiums and when you're adding cofactors like P5P, that you are going to absorb more in your red blood cells. But again, we typically try to target multiple biopathways when we build products. So the magnesium is one, but there's a lot of other really powerful minerals for sleep. Probably the most interesting one that I wasn't aware of was potassium. So obviously, having been ketogenic now for almost 30 years, I've been aware of the importance of potassium for hydration. You know, sodium, of course, is a really important mineral. 
and readily available in salt. But many years ago, I realized on a ketogenic diet, it's really easy to become potassium deficient, become dehydrated. So I started to take more potassium in my diet and that really changed things. However, my co-formulator on this, Mr. Newts, said, no, we need potassium for sleep. And I dived into the literature and I found this really interesting data from like 2004 on odd mutant flies that found that sodium excites neurons, that it actually excites the brain, and then potassium quiets down neurons. It actually quiets down channel activity. So essentially what that means, what that translates to is in the morning, it's a really good idea to throw some salt, some Himalayan salt or sea salt in with your water or your coffee. I'm a big fan of salt coffee if you've never tried black coffee with salt. It, it's really cool. I, I love it. It's like a more savory type of coffee experience. But throw in maybe a quarter teaspoon of salt, blend it. It tastes really good. And then in the evening, shift more to potassium and there's something called new salt, which is a potassium chloride salt that you can use on your food. And of course, we have potassium gluconate inside of sleep breakthrough, and which also will help kind of quiet down your heart and slow down your heart rate a little bit. Then we have calcium, which boosts REM, and it also helps convert tryptophan into serotonin, which again, anything that increases serotonin will typically help you sleep better because it is a building block for melatonin. And then we have zinc orotate, which is also a mel melatonin cofactor and calms the nervous system. So all of those minerals are awesome for sleep. And then we also targeted GABA. So GABA is really one of the key molecules for great sleep. I mean, we call it the molecule of chill. If you look at people that really struggle with sleep, it tends to be about 30% deficient in GABA. We tested virtually every form of GABA on the market, and we settled on pharma GABA because it's just stronger and it's very powerful. I mean, it's a very, very potent form of GABA and basically quiets down your your brain, which means that your beta brainwave activity will actually lower significantly. And a lot of people that struggle with sleep, they have the hamster wheel going, their beta brainwave activity is just incessant. They can't stop it. And the reason that is from a, an electrical standpoint is that the beta brainwaves are just hyperactive. So there's a few molecules you can take that will slow down your beta brainwave activity and increase alpha brainwaves. And pharma GABA is a big one. And the other one, which is probably my favorite sleep molecule, is L-theanine. So L-theanine is another amino acid typically derived from green tea. And I've been using it for probably six, seven years. Your body doesn't adapt and it increases alpha brainwaves and it promotes relaxation without causing drowsiness. And when you stack it with pharma GABA, it just, it's even more powerful. So that was the other one. And then finally, we have glycine, which I mentioned earlier. But the other really cool thing about glycine, it actually helps to lower your core body temperature by increasing blood flow to your body's extremities. So it's a REM booster. It'll make you feel less fatigued the next day, even if you didn't sleep enough, and it lowers your body temp. So we blended all of that together in our new product called Sleep Breakthrough with some natural flavoring, which is blue spirulina, some berry extracts, and stevia. And there's some bamboo silica as well, which is another mineral. We, we added that for more texture and flavor. Nice. I love that. And I, I'm glad that you walked us through all of those ingredients because I, I do think it's important. I recently did a blood test. Actually, it wasn't that recent. Maybe, yeah, maybe a couple months ago. And I've been like taking various electrolytes and, you know, your sleep supplements, some other things. And for the first time, it said that actually my potassium levels were too high. And I, you know, do this test, it's with Inside Tracker. So I do this test every quarter. So I have like a bunch of data from the past few years. And I don't know if you know anything about that. Like, is it possible to, because obviously when I get these tests done, I always take it with a grain of salt because you know, this company may, might say, hey, your level is too high, but that actually doesn't mean much. It could mean that you're actually okay. You know what I mean? Like everything is quite personalized. But in your experience, is it possible to have a potassium level that's too high? And if so, like what would symptoms be associated with that? You know? It would certainly be rare. And I would 
again, it's just me speculating, but I would speculate that if that's the case, if it's truly the case, that you most likely have some interesting genetic variants around that. I've never known of any issues related to having potassium too high. In general, most people are on the other side, right? Your sodium to potassium ratios need to be in balance. Otherwise, you're going to be, if your sodiums are too, levels are too high, potassium's too low, you'll tend to go urinate a lot. You just struggle to keep water into your body. And obviously, I'm not going to make any medical claims here, but your blood pressure can rise. There's a lot of things that occur when your potassium levels are too low. I've never, I've never known of anyone having issues because their potassium levels are too high. So first time I hear to hear about that and very interesting to me, but yeah, most likely probably some genetic variants. Your body has a lot of ways of eliminating e- excess minerals, whether it's excess sodium and excess other nutrients. So it's quite possible that your body's just really good at expelling sodium and really good at c- keeping potassium. But I personally wouldn't be concerned about it because I think I'm more concerned about the other way where my sodium is too high and potassium is too low. Yeah, exactly. So, and that was exactly my thinking when I saw those results. Because initially when you see something like that, well, like in any blood test, right? Like you say, okay, I'm going to stop taking electrolytes. I'm going to stop taking any type of supplement that might have potassium in it. But then, like you said, like, is there really an issue with it being high? And like, what is it... in relation to magnesium or sodium or the other minerals that it works with? And also like, are you experiencing any negative side effects or symptoms from it? So I kind of just ignored it, to be honest, (laughs) for the reasons that we've talked about. But I think it could definitely, you know, I, I do agree that a lower potassium level is much more of concern than a higher one. So I met one of the chief innovation officers at Gatorade a few years ago at an e-beverage event. And of course, I'm not endorsing Gatorade, but they were they created this really fascinating mineral sweat detection technology for pro athletes. I, I don't know if they ever released it, but I saw the original prototypes and had some really great conversations with them. And what occurs is when people sweat, whether it's through exercise or sauna or whatever, there's different mineral ratios that are being expelled. So some people sweat more sodium, some people sweat more potassium, and they actually developed a technology that allows them to see what the sweat mineral content is. And then obviously you want to be able to replace the right mineral loss with the right mineral intake. So anyways, I I think we're just a few years away from really cracking the code on, on that if it hasn't been cracked already behind the scenes. Yeah, I do think that's interesting. I I exercise quite frequently, but I also like sweat in saunas and steam rooms a lot. Like I would say right now, maybe like four times a week. So I, I've always thought about how is that impacting my mineral balances and my electrolytes and things like that. Again, I haven't really had any negative side effects or symptoms that I've experienced. I'm almost like addicted to it because I, I feel so so good after doing it. And it really helps with my mental health, to be honest. So it's it's something that I prioritize, but we're getting off topic here, but I will keep an eye out for research about that because I I do think it's important to really value that as well. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I know you're in Panama, but like, do you do any type of heat therapy as like kind of in your biohacking protocol lifestyle? Yeah, there's a few uh, saunas. I'm probably going to get set up with some ice. I've been, you know, I was in Miami just a couple of weeks ago and I was hitting it every day and I'm just feeling so good. So I think in Panama, it's easy to, it's a lot easier to overheat in general. So my body, I think is craving more cold exposure, which is interesting because yeah, you're in Vancouver. I, I live there and there's so many behaviors that change when you go from living in Canada to the tropics, for an example, I used to drink a ton of tea all the time in Canada. I almost never drink tea here. So I think there's some key differences where humidity, temperature, sun exposure, it changes a lot of things in your body and what your kind of desires are as well in terms of things like sauna or cold exposure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I actually... 
I want to just quickly pick your brain before we wrap up about Panama, because like I said, before we started recording, my fiance and I are playing with the idea of what it would look like to move to Central America. We both work online and we can work from anywhere in the world. And so it's one of those things where I, as much as, and you very much understand that since you are Canadian, as much as I think the quality of life in Canada is fantastic, I'm not sure that the lifestyle here reflects my values anymore, which is a very, you know, difficult decision and and things that I'm thinking about. But for you, like what was, and again, you can share as much as you feel comfortable, but what was like the moment or the catalyst that really made you decide that, hey, I don't think Canada is working for me anymore. I need to live somewhere else that better suits me and my lifestyle. Yeah, I've never really covered this on a podcast, so let's go for it. I started reading some books in my really early 20s, like Permanent Traveler and some other books that really impacted how I saw the world. And I had a deep frustration from, I think, the age of like 19 or 20 around how I felt the government was wasting tax dollars. It wasn't just like having an issue with paying obscene amounts of tax, but I was just like, watching the waste and how it was spent. And I was just like, what are they doing? You know? And I always felt like if I can go somewhere, vote with my feet, go where I have more agency and control over my health, how ta- how my tax dollars are spent, that I would feel more freedom and started doing a lot of homework around that and started looking at different places around the world to live. And Panama was definitely the top spot for me at the time. And, and I have not found any place better for a few reasons. One is I want to live in a city. So if, if you want to live in a city in the Americas, in a good place that's hot, good climate, Panama is pretty tough to beat. Now there's some other, if you want to be, live more on the beach or in isolation or live in the jungle, I'd probably recommend Costa Rica. I think the geography, nature is very similar. However, Costa Rica is further along with service and tourism. And I think it's easier to find good people to do things in general. And Panama is a better city. I, I'm not a big fan of San Jose at all in Costa Rica, but you know, there's some beautiful beaches and resorts and things. So it really depends what you're looking for. I think they both check the boxes of feeling free. And I don't really feel like I live in Panama. I feel like I live in the world psychologically and I'm able to get direct flights to almost the majority of the cities that I frequent, which is great. And in terms of expat communities, it's awesome. So yeah, I mean, there's some downsides, but in general, the plus sides uh, outweigh the downsides by four or five to one. I don't miss Canada. I don't miss the cold. I don't miss taxes. And it's been heartbreaking to watch the political shifts in the last few years. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's important to kind of reassess and yeah, it has been tough and I'm not going to lie, like the political changes that have happened, you know, with COVID and everything have really, really sped up this process for me in terms of like where I stand on things and what I want to do. My biggest thing right now, though, is, like I said, like I want to have kids in the next couple of years. And it's really, really shifted my thinking, even though like we're not trying at all right now, because now I feel like it's not about only me. It's about a child. And do I want a child to grow up in a society like Vancouver? (laughs) And not that anything's really bad with Vancouver. It's again, it's more just like, I don't know if this type of lifestyle fully reflects my values anymore. And so I just don't know if that's the best place that I think a kid should grow up. So it's it's really changed things for me. So I'm doing my research. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. If you need any su- suggestions or guidance, hit me up anytime. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, so we go to Costa Rica for three weeks next week, and then we may, <laughs> might be a little wild, we may drive like buy a car, an old car, drive from Vancouver to Panama next winter and do like a seven month trip going through the States, going through Texas, Mexico, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of look at all of Central America, 
bring our dog work from different Airbnbs and then make a decision after that. Because a lot of the advice that I hear in the digital nomad communities, expat communities is very much like spend multiple months down here before you pack up and move. So you actually have a more accurate feeling of what it's going to be like. Yeah, it takes you about six months to get a good feel for a culture. I spent about six months in Japan, for an example, when I was in my late 20s, early 30s. And yeah, it took me, I started really sensing what the culture was like after like four months, five months. It's easy to get enchanted by the newness and the novelty of a, of a new place, but you want to make sure you're spending enough time to really see if your core values align with the place that you want to live in. Because a lot of people come in, they're attracted to the weather and some other benefits, but then culturally, it's just not a match for them. For me, it is. I think one of the things you'll experience in general out here is more freedom. And it's a little bit different. It's more like a Wild West type of freedom where you're not being hyper-policed and watched and regulated by a onerous laws and law enforcement, where here it's a little more, you know, do whatever you want within boundaries and nobody doesn't really care. So so it's it's a little bit different, but I thrive in that. I do. I feel, like I said, a level of freedom that when you go to places like United States or Canada, you you, you tend to feel the opposite. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for sharing about that. And thank you for coming on the podcast today. This has been so easy and so great. If people want to try some of the different supplements that you suggested, where can they go and how can they connect with you? Yeah, just go to bioptimizers.com. It's by B-I optimizers.com. Check us out. And I think we have a special discount code for your listeners, right? You have a discount code? Yes, yes, I do. Yep. Yeah, which is I think just biohacking Brittany. So yeah, check out sleepbreakthrough.com forward slash biohacking Brittany. Check it out. All of our products have a 365 day, no questions asked, money back guarantee. So for any reason it doesn't work for you, hit us up and we'll give you every penny back because we don't want your money unless we're delivering you world-class results. That's it. Nice. I love that. I will put all of that in the show notes for everybody and link it on my website. I think, I mean, it's already on my website, but for these show notes, I'll link it again. And again, thank you so much for coming on. This was great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.